Thank you for joining. Um, I can't help feeling like uh, that person that shows their holiday photos and bores people to tears, but I'll try and keep it a bit more interesting than that. Um, yeah, I'll soon know if it's boring. I hear snoring from behind me. Um, so, uh, so in a minute, what I'll do is I'll do a screen share and, and put a recording in progress. 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 Just make sure you're, in fact, I'm just going to mute everybody. Hey, Michael. Okay. Yeah, so what I've done, all I've done really is put together in a kind of a pretty much, although don't pick me up, the people that came. Um, a chronological order of kind of how the photos and, and a few videos came up and um, I'll just kind of walk you through the trip and kind of try to bring a bit of colour to it although the pictures and the video kind of speak for themselves and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges because there were a few more challenges this time um, than there's been on previous ones. Um, for those of you that don't know this is the third jungle trip so the first one was to Borneo and that was in 2019, just before COVID. Um, and that was, the, that was the first time. And then the second one was to Guatemala in Central America. Um, and then this was the third one. Um, and they've kind of started to become a, a thing. So um, at the end of this one, I'll talk a little bit about where the potential ones are going to be for spring 2025. There's, there's a couple of wild cards and there's, there's a couple of front runners. So I'll kind of give an insight to those. Um, but yeah, and so there's, there's a few bits of video in the, in the presentation and I kind of, I am denied about putting those in or not, but I think what they do is give you um, an unfiltered view of what it was like, you know, there and then, what the sounds were like, what, you know, what, um, what the emotion was like and, uh, and, and what the environment was like. So, you know, pictures paint, photos paint a good picture, but video gives a bit more of a raw feeling of, of what it was like unfiltered. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll start it now. Any questions you've got, um, please feel free to send a, a, a text through. Try not to unmute yourself and ask because it'll disrupt the presentation. Um, but send them through as words and if I see them come up, I'll answer them in the presentation. Or, um, or you can save it and I'll, I'll leave a bit of time for any questions anyone might have at the end. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try and keep the start and the end pretty close together. All right. Okay, can you just give me a thumbs up that you can see the presentation, okay? Great. Matt, can I turn any of these lights off? Yeah, yeah, turn it. Or is it yeah, now you can turn them all on if you like, that would be better. Yeah. You can't turn it off one at a time, you can turn all three off. All three? Yeah. You can do that, Helen, it's just like getting is, back to your basher. It's in the other room, isn't it? Just on the side, as you go out the door, just on the left hand side, it's the top three switches. Oh, yeah. Is that... Oh, God. It's all right. <laughs> do you want a light? What's the light? Is that the... Okay, have we got a full screen? Great, all right, so excuse the bright yellow and red. I thought that was quite Indian in color, but it's quite stark now I look at it. Um, so, India Jungle Expedition um, to the Arunachal Pradesh. If any of you haven't heard of that, you can be forgiven. It's quite a remote area um, and you'll see on a map quite where it is in India, um, but it's right up in the Northeast corner. Um, these were a couple of images at the start that kind of um, define my view of this jungle. Um, it was quite stark in terms of the hills, but also how far you can see. Quite often when you go to jungle, you're in it and you can't really see much apart from the next few trees, but we were quite lucky to get, certainly in the second half of the trip, 
quite a few moments where you could just see out over the vista for quite a long way and it's you know seeing that many trees is you'd think it was boring but it's quite spectacular um, this was a view from the jungle house that we um, kind of rendezvoused in before we went into the jungle um, and that was one from on the trek and, and you'll see a few more as we go so the journey started at Heathrow so we all met up at Heathrow uh, this is the group kind of getting together um, all bar one of us met at Heathrow and uh, Horst from Germany went straight to India um, so that was the trip Heathrow to Delhi so Delhi is pretty central in India and then if you can see where uh, Bhutan and Myanmar are that right up in the northeast corner is where the Arunachal Pradesh is so this is the flyover and then yeah so we landed in Delhi and then flew another three hours then um, on the same day across to Dubruga which is about as far northeast as you can go in India so you know it's, it's a huge country that was the second part and then when we arrived in this is in Dubruga airport we were met already by this real dazzling colour that you get in India um, and then we were met by a convoy of cars that took us from Dubruga up through the mountains to Pashagat, where we spent the first night. Um, so that was the, the convoy of cars. We had eight cars um, split down in between them. And then we arrived at the jungle camp and we got the first bit of kit issue. So you couldn't take gas. So we, we cooked all our own food. So we got given the gas. And on each of the jungle trips, um, we, I get the locals to and we're very fortunate that they, they always get handmade. So they handmade um, knives. So in Borneo, we got a, um, a parang. In Central America, we got a machete. And here we got what they call a dao, which is, um, there's a couple of Indian knives. There's obviously a kukli that a lot of people will know from the Gurkhas in Nepal. And this was more particular to the Arunachal Pradesh region. And it's called a dao. Um, and it's quite a big knife, but it was amazing. We had 23 of them, 24 including the guide. Every single knife was different, had different shape, different carvings, different design on the, the sheath. So it was quite amazing. Um, so we had a brief, uh, lots of briefs, but this was the brief before we went in just on the basics of hydration, acclimatization, the importance of looking after your buddy and the importance of um, a few of the very basic things, the wet kit, dry kit routine. Um, and that'll become more apparent in a minute. Uh, that was kind of the, the, the mug shots before we went in. So that was at the jungle camp. Uh, the guide down on the left hand side, uh, Katu was our, our main guide, uh, a great guy. And this was the biggest one so far. So there were 23 of us, um, not including the guides on this one. And then, so we stayed there a night and then the next day we drove from Pashagat another hour and a half up to Damro, which you can see just at the top, um, a much more windy kind of road. And um, then we walked into the jungle from, from Damro. Uh, before we went in, um, uh, we got a blessing. And they did that for everybody. So this was a, looks a bit ramshackle. But this was a, um, a makeshift uh, kind of church temple before, um, uh, as they were building a new one. And then we were in. So the first walk uh, was, some, it looks like you had a house on their back. You can see the size of the rucksacks and the amount of kit that had to be carried. So the weight of the kit, oh no. I'm gonna have to pause this guys. I'm gonna need to go and get a power uh, cable. Give me a couple of minutes. I'm just gonna get a power cable. Go with me. Yeah, so they're 
schoolboy error. Uh, so yeah, as we were leaving the village, you can see where the locals kind of worked the fields because um, there were, you know, short, small steps and bridges and things. But within about an hour and a half, two hours, we kind of started to, to move out and more into jungle. You could still see for the first day for sure where the locals um, still went because they, you could see traps on the animal tracks. It's pretty much all animal tracks that we walked. There were no man-made tracks, um, but you could see some of the snares and traps that they used to catch boar and small game for food. Um, for, for, certainly for the first day, we could see that. Okay, and then kind of that was a, a view through some kind of pasture fields that they kind of used to, to grow uh, rice and, and wheat and some other stuff. Where they've kind of obviously cleared the jungle. Matt, can you step to the left? Is that better? Yeah. And then those pipes that you can see are water pipes that they use to bring uh, water from the jungle down to the village. Um, that gives you an idea, it starts to give you an idea of the, kind of the size of some of the trees. And um, I, pictures never really do it justice, but you know, just the, the, the sheer size of some of the trees is staggering. And the thistles, so that was a thistle that was like twice the size of me. Um, and then it, again, it, you can't quite see it on the picture, but those that will remember, the colour on those was so vivid that it looked like something off Avatar. It looked like they were illuminated as you walked past them. Um, so then, typically a day goes, we, we, we set off about 7.30 um, and stop round about, uh, we, we have regular stops as we go, but we stop round about um, 11, 11.30 for lunch, uh, usually about three quarters of an hour to an hour for lunch. So this is everyone stopped and, and getting their gas burners out, and cooking up a hot meal for lunch. Sometimes we were joined by friends. <laughs> oh. uh, the videos aren't going to play, I don't think. Right, maybe that's not one. Um, and for the first three days, uh, so this, this one was hard for a couple of reasons. Pretty much the first three days were all uphill. Um, there's always hills in a jungle, but this one was pretty relentless. Usually it's kind of up, then down, up, then down, and you, you get a bit of break. But this one was pretty much all up for the first three days. And by day two, it was raining. It was raining on day one. By day two, it was raining pretty much constantly. 
you can see that you know starts to get a bit slippery and afoot especially when you're on a single track and especially when there's you're at the tail end of 23 other people so you know that the, the weather was just one of the challenges um, and then round about so first light was about half four five o'clock in the morning and there was 12 hours of light and darkness a pretty even split so last light was about 4 30. so we generally stopped about 2 2 30 and that gave people a good couple of hours to stop find out where they're going to put their hammock up so you need to pick two trees that are going to support you for the night um, and then it gives them about two hours to firstly get your sleeping system set up so your tarp your hammock and then start to get yourself comfortable and prepared for the next for the night and then the next day so getting your wet kit off um, drying your feet out towel powdering your feet cleaning them and um, getting some hot food inside you and then before you know it two hours are gone and it's pitch black and there's no movement in the jungle at night because it's just not safe not because you get eaten well you might get eaten by certain things but not big animals like you think but just because it's too dangerous to on um, you know you might turn an ankle, walk into something sharp and spiky. So pretty much when darkness comes, you're in your bed and you're in there for a good 12 hours. So lack of sleep certainly wasn't a problem. Um, so this was the guides and the guides were brilliant. They would always help out with um, finding the trees and, and clearing the area. Um, this is a, don't worry, it looks like it's been deforested um, and it has been, but just the small stuff which grows back, you know, like weeds, so it grows back really quickly. Uh, let's see if this plays. Yeah, and here you can see, that's the locals and us, probably the most dangerous part of the trip when people are swinging their uh, knives around, just trying to clear a bit of space to make it safe so that, you know, you can get up in the night and go to the toilet and not worry about um, walking into something. And then kind of camp looks, usually looks something like that. Um, you know, people are generally quite close together uh, for support. Um, and the, you know, we'd, we had three groups. So there were three groups of eight, or two of eight, one of six. And uh, we'd give each group an area. So each group would be concentrated on the area. And they'd, you know, if some people were set up a bit quicker, then they'd, you know, help and support um, someone else who'd maybe had a problem with their trees or was newer to the idea of setting up your system. You'd think, how hard is that to set up? But to set it up when it's raining and you know, you're fairly new to the skill, you've been walking all day, quite tired, um, it, it takes longer than you think. Uh, that was Stefan and Petter, I think. The Swedes, the Vikings. Um, and before you got your tarp set up, that was the kind of view as you were lying in your hammock and looking up, or if you were able to look out and look up, and then, yeah, quite an amazing view. And then once you've got yourself set up, there was a bit of time to get together and have a, a communal meal. And normally the meals were done in groups and people would have a chance to chat, reflect on the day and um, share some stories. And then here's three of the guides. So, you know, quite young guys you can see, and you know, it looks like there's nothing of them, um, but, um, but certainly fit and strong um, as the guys that live their lives in those environments are. Uh, they'd always get a fire going in the evening um, and they'd normally put up uh, like a makeshift tent. You'll see it in a minute. Uh, so there were know, one, two, three, four. Yeah, eight of them in total that came with us on the track. Yeah, that's, so that's their tarp. So <laughs> quite a bit bigger, but they kind of then slept on the floor. Um, and this is if it plays. This is what the sound is like just as it's get. You can see it's still a bit light through the trees. Um, but this is the sound that comes out just as it's getting dark. So, that's just coming off the computer speakers, but literally everything that can make a noise makes a noise. So that happens like clockwork, just after last light. And then 
as soon, as soon as it starts, then it literally, almost like that, it just stops. It's like they're on a, uh, on a, on a recorder and someone hits the stop button and they stop, like literally all at the same time. It's quite, quite amazing. Um, is the group ready to step off? There's Stefan, one of the uh, Vikings. And, um, and we really get a, 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 a mix of ages. So from people in their 60s, 50s, 40s, 20s. And these were friends that kind of accompanied us. They were a bit of a shock at first. I remember uh, Tom, one of the guys that came from Australia, I, he came, got up one morning and um, literally it looked like he'd had a fight with an axe murderer in his hammock. And because his shirt was just covered in big patches of blood. And, um, you know, they don't start that big, obviously, that, that's a leech, if anyone doesn't know. They start like little threads of cotton that you can hardly see. And so you've really got to do a good check before you get into your hammock. And uh, this, is, this is the first time on, even when I was in the army, the jungle trips that I've had leeches as prevalent as they were on this one. And literally sometimes you'd look down and they'd be like crawling up your legs and you'd just kind of flick them off um, or squirt some uh, repellent on them. But yeah, if you didn't get them off and you took them into your hammock with you, I mean, there's no harm done. They, they like a, unlike a mosquito, they don't really carry diseases. They don't, um, uh, they don't leave a, a, a bite mark that is really itchy and scratches and can get infected. Once they, they've had their fill, they drop off, but, um, but they, they certainly, the, the, the scene of the crime is a lot more, um, a lot wilder than a, than a, a mosquito. Um, and there's Lawrence with the evidence of one uh, that, that kind of got under his hat and it's dripping down the front. I don't know if you can quite see that. Um, so that's what you do with your boots at night. Uh, you either put them in your rucksack and clip it over or you just make a couple of stakes and stick them upside down. And so at night you take off all of your wet clothes. So your wet socks, wet boots, wet trousers, shirt. Um, you get into some dry kit uh, or you just sleep um, with your boxer shorts on if it's warm enough. Um, but then because you've got to get out of the wet kit and let your body heal. So you, you, if you're in wet kit, your body's having to work to try to dry it out and try to keep your body dry. So you want to make sure you're completely dry and warm and get in so that your body gets overnight that good 12 hours to recover itself, ready for the exertions of the next day. Okay, so this is possibly the steepest basher location, even, even in the army, that I've ever had to try and set up. So I'm just going to show you a few of them. Otherwise known as Hayden the Bat, they sound like them. Uh, Tom in there, is Tom just coming down? We've got Kai, he's dead, Christoph. That's just his backside over there. Uh, that's Mike over there. Uh, and there's some at the top there, on the midway. That's Hall, Horst with the yellow. Uh, with the top on top of his top. That's mine next to him. And we got Max down the bottom. We've got who we got there? Uh, Gary in there. And Gary's going to be on quite an angle. Um, it's hard to appreciate actually just how steep that was, but if you dropped a water bottle and someone did who was right next to me, you had to run fast or you'd have a long way to go back and get your water bottle. So it, um, it was really steep. But the good thing about, and really a hammock and a tarp, if any of you haven't done it, is the only way to go in the jungle. One, it keeps you off the ground, but two, there's almost no flat areas in the jungle. And so as you can see, you could be on the side of a mountain and still find a level um, most of the time. Although quite a few people talk about not having a level hammock and not having a great night's sleep because you just end up in a ball at the bottom of your, of your hammock if you don't get it right. So for the first three days, this was pretty much the view. We were like walking up through the clouds. Um, most of the time we were under the canopy. And when it did, when we did kind of come out on the side of one of the mountains, ridge lines, you couldn't really see much. 
So it was quite, quite low visibility. So you, you didn't really have an appreciation apart from how hard it was of how high we were climbing. Um, we say sometimes the locals uh, made a fire for us too, so that people could have a go at drying out their kit. And this was the thing on the end of day three, which was the, the longest day, the wettest day, and quite a people. So this was one of the lessons really. Um, people had to ask some serious questions of themselves. It was cold at times, not what you expect in the jungle. Uh, it was wet, it, you know, on this day it rained almost non-stop and, you know, jungle rain can be quite heavy rain. Uh, you know, your kit got twice as heavy, um, the, the going was slippery um, and it kind of suppresses your mood a little bit when it's raining. You know, you all know that from being out in rain and, you know, people really had to dig deep and ask some questions about, you know, what they were made of. Um, and to support each other and, and to get through the day. And, you know, that's an adventure. You know, an adventure isn't a, a relaxed, easy walk in the woods or walk in the jungle. You know, you want to be tested a little bit. And by day three, people were starting to be tested and you could see it and feel it in the group. Luckily, there was no easy way off. So people had to find the answers, but you still, you know, you, as you, I wrote, you know, as you, as you, scrape away inside yourselves to dig deep and find those answers you know that hole that you dig fills up and it it fills up with a strength um, and, and, a, and a knowledge of, of what you can do and what you can get through so yeah just another idea of just how wet it was at the top people were huddled under bashes um because it was just raining too heavy even really to get your kit up so we got three up and each of the groups got under one to try and stay dry while they waited for the rain to stop and then we had to make um, a bit of a decision um, on whether we pushed it and went further and introduced risk that didn't really need to be introduced or whether we took, and we were pretty much at the highest point, whether we took that point at the end of day three and turned around and went back down a slightly different route. And um, so I spoke at length with the guys and spoke with the group and the decision we made for a number of reasons was to come back down rather than we were going to do a more circuitous route around skirting around the edge of the mountain and coming back down quite a steep part that runs alongside a river but with the amount of rainfall we had we decided that that would be introducing a risk that didn't need to be introduced in terms of as you went down that hill by the side of the river there were some parts that were quite rocky and quite slippery and quite easy to slip and go into the river and with that amount of rainfall, that wouldn't have been safe. Mm. So we decided to go back down the way we'd come. Um, and this was the morning that we kind of made that decision. So that's the morning of day four. Um, but as you can see, like the camaraderie was uh, amazing. And no sooner did we start coming back down, but the kind of the, the clouds started to part uh, the views, you started to be able to see what we'd just come up. And just, you know, some of those views were quite spectacular. So that was the guides. And this was the last night, the last night I came. This is, this is me. Uh, I'm at my said, okay, but um, this is where I'll be keeping dry tonight. And this is, I thought this is going to be a great little shot. This is everyone setting up their camp for the night. So, uh, groups two and three there. Group one just over there, and that's the, the local guides in their, <laughs> their big tent. Um, but yeah, no, everyone's pretty slick with their drills now. Um, they're getting up, they've been doing that for about 15, 20 minutes, and most of them are pretty much there. So. I said the target for them is to try and get it up within 20 minutes um, and uh, you know you've got to find the trees in that time as well so give them a bit of grace but yeah they're doing great last day the skills looking good and um, this would be a great last night's camp before we head back in tomorrow and so I don't know if you could hear that at home but you know certainly by day actually quite early on uh, this this group were really good with their admin and with their ability to get their 
admin den and their tarp and hammock up and you know by you know 20 minutes is a good target for that it's not easy and you've got to be smooth you've got to be slick you've got to know where everything is you've got to have put everything back properly the night before and not just rammed it all in your rucksack and then you know spend 20 minutes undoing knots before you even think about getting your hammock up and your tarp but they were on the ball and you know within 20 minutes pretty much everyone was done and up and that's that's good that's kind of almost only good um as i said some of the, the wildlife although not big was still kind of um, arresting so that's the kind of on the last morning and before the walk out final brief and then as i said the journey out kind of the sun came out and The views are quite stunning. It's the uh, morning of the last full day, so we've got another full day's hike today, um, and another camp out tonight. And then a short walk in to the, the last village before the jungle, really. It's been quite an amazing trip. Um, it's been a really challenging first three days out. And then a bit more relaxed coming back, but for some, much harder coming back because, you know, downhill uh, with a full pack can be um, just as hard, if not harder, uh, than, than the, you know, the, the hike up. But um, people have really come through it well. I've been really impressed. Um, some great self-discipline and um, some people have looked at themselves and dug deep and pushed through um, and you know found some depth and uh, the character of everyone your teamwork of everyone has been amazing been really proud of everyone it's been a, a really good trip but complacency is the enemy so even though we're on the last routine it's important that um, that people stay switched on stay awake keep looking out for each other keep paying attention to the small details uh, until we get back. And I, I'll say here, Simon did uh, amazing. So he, before, Simon's a marathon runner, so luckily he's really fit, but he had a, 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 a pretty much severed Achilles. Um, he, he spoke to a doctor and the doctor said it's okay to go, but you know, some of the slippery bits and the steep bits, Simon found particularly challenging. There were times when he was on his hands and knees going up, but he carried his pack the whole time and, um, and he just got stronger as each day went on, you know, more, more confident, more capable and, um, and uh, yeah, quite, quite an amazing achievement to have got through that uh, with, with, with a leg that, half a leg that didn't work. So it was quite amazing. Um, and we started to see quite a bit of water on the way down. Uh, that's the resting position for, for some of the locals. And again, these are the, the views from kind of a bit lower down. So there's rice fields um, that kind of support the local village and, and a bit further field, I guess. And then before we knew it, kind of a, you know, nearly a week had gone, uh, we were in the jungle and we were on our way back to um, the jungle camp uh, in a convoy. And um, ah, we did have, we had one expected stop at the police station. So the local police came and got us um, uh, at, at the village and what we thought was going to be quite a routine just checking um, the names we had to get permits to go to this particular region because there's some trouble with China um, but uh, but yeah they, they had got us to follow them to the police station um, and if you can see it it's there on the right but it doesn't look much different to any of those other buildings there 
um, and we all had to go in and um, they got us to sign a piece of paper that they didn't really know which paper they wanted us to sign. So I think there was a bit of a scrabble around and I think they found anything in the end, to be honest. And um, we just had to kind of put our signature down next to our name. And, um, and then after that, they all wanted their photos taken with us. So I'm not quite sure how, how yeah, uh, serious a, a thing it was, but I, I think it was just very unusual for the area. They didn't quite know what to do. So they just wanted to make sure that they had a list of everyone that came out and that we were all okay. Um, before we kind of went on our way. Landslides are a big problem there. And um, this is, so this wasn't there on the way out and it had come down while we were in the jungle. Um, and that, so that's a fresh landslide. It wasn't there when we came. So that's happened in the last week. So, you know, thankfully, they were able to clear it quite quick and, um, and it, it didn't impede us too much. Um, and then before we knew it, we all had a shower, had a few beers and just relaxed and started to reflect on, on the six days and, and what a kind of up and down journey it was. Um, curry became quite a, uh, quite a signature of the next. For a week, I had curry for breakfast, lunch and dinner and I, I quite like curry, so I loved it. But um, it was great. Uh, and it's just amazing going through, you know, the rural areas and seeing that animals have a higher priority than human beings. So, you know, cars stopped and, and waited for them to pass and walked around them. Uh, we found a few little kids. Um, and then we had one more night at the jungle camp and then we had the R&R &R phase. Uh, so we always try and build in um, at least two or three nights at the end just to take the time to come down off the, the experience of the adventure part, uh, the jungle part, um, and then to you know, take the time to reflect on it, to savor it, to share the experience with the people that came um, in the contrast of a little bit of luxury. So this was the place and it was just kind of out of this world really. Literally, it was like something out of your imagination. It was a, a 500 year old hill fort that was literally built on the side of a mountain. Um, was once owned by royalty and then I think when they could no longer afford it they sold it and it was bought by an Indian very wealthy man I'm sure um, and he's made it his kind of life's work to restore these old places and, and to allow them to kind of pay for themselves he's turned them into luxury hotels and I think there's I think I count about 30 odd of these sort of places that he's um, he's, he's renovated and restored and and has got in a chain around India. But it was like around every corner was just something spectacular. No one went back to their room the same way. Um, every night yeah, people got lost and because they, you know, you can see how big it is. There were rooms all over this place and you know, you'd go down and so many dead ends trying to find your way back. Like I say, around every corner was just some, something you just didn't expect to see. Um, all of those are kind of holes in the wall with lanterns in them. Uh, there was, at breakfast, there was always, well, and lunch and dinner, there was always a lady making fresh pita breads that were just out of this world. Uh, this was just outside the fort, and this was a, a well, actually. Um, so it, it's at different levels going down. I, I guess it fills up to different levels and um, people kind of go down and, and draw water from this. This is all the hill fort. And ironically, we saw more wildlife out of the jungle than in it, um, which can kind of be a bit surprising and disappointing until you think that if you, if you go to a wild place, you won't see animals um, because they're not used to human beings. So they, they don't want to be seen because um, they're, you know, we're the scariest thing in any, any environment. Um, so uh, it's only when you come back to, a, to places where there's lots of people that you'll start to see a lot of wildlife. There are exceptions and, and there, there were in Borneo and Guatemala, but, um, but by and large, um, it's the small things that you see. But yeah, these were all kind of in and around the hill fort. And um, 
you know, at night time, you can see this was the view from there and it's just flat to the mountains and the, the, the sunsets were quite spectacular. And that, at the bottom of the screen, you can see there's an amphitheater um, that I think they either rebuilt or renovated and we were lucky enough to see a show there, um, which was amazing. You can see Freddie Mercury um, come back to life in the middle at the back. Um, and there were some nice pools. And so yeah, we did a yoga session with a, the, the guy in the middle um, in black. Uh, you wouldn't think it, but he's 107. Um, and uh, he did a yoga session for us. Um, pretty authentic. The yoga seemed quite similar to the yoga I've seen, but his introduction was uh, amazing. He took some time to explain it um, and the, the philosophy behind it um, and the idea of yoga and, and a healthy, connected living. Uh, we also had a, a, an Indian cookery lesson from a, the chef at the hotel, which again was staggering. And there were, I think the village had 7,000 people in it that was just below Nimrana and the hotel employed 700 people. So a tenth of the people from that village were employed in the hotel and, you know, trained and given the skills. It was quite amazing. Um, we had high tea and, uh, and a dance. And then we, on the last day, we went to Delhi and what a contrast. So we went from the Arunachal Pradesh, which has 13 people per square kilometer, one of the most um, uh, underpopulated places in the world, to Delhi, which is one of the most densely populated places in the world. And I've never seen streets with so many things on it. Like the wires at the top, there were monkeys running along them. Um, and then everything you can imagine you know, down below. Uh, and there was, um, so these were the buildings built during the, uh, the British Raj. Um, still standing, although they are moving those, or they're moving uh, the, the, the political infrastructure somewhere else. Um, we, had a, we had a ride on some, um, oh, what are they called? Not rickshaws. Rickshaws, rickshaws, I think. Yeah. So they're, they're bicycle powered. Um, yeah, again, that was the street we went down. Uh, we went to the spice markets, um, we saw a snake charmer. And then that was the final dinner in uh, Delhi before we hung up our boots for another 18 months and um, think about the next one. So uh, I've already, it's almost a continuous cycle really, I'm already starting to think about uh, where the next ones might be. I've had a, a meeting with the people that helped me with the travel arrangements and, um, and there's a couple of front runners, so Kenya, um, it, so a lot of people have been asking me about Africa. Um, I think it would be amazing. Um, just got to see if it's a financially, logistically a viable option. Um, but we're looking into it at the moment. Um, it would be with the Maasai. They would be the guides. Um, and obviously in Kenya, you've got Kilimanjaro, the Rift Valley. Um, and then, you know, the, the stunning backdrops. Um, and that, interestingly, two of the really good ones we've done so far, Borneo and Guatemala, are exactly where the British Army does its jungle training. And Kenya is the, the other place. So, you know, I, I'm quite hopeful. Um, Madagascar is another one. Um, they did say to me when I spoke about it that they've got some people on the ground that I could speak to, but the infrastructure isn't really there in Madagascar. It's still quite wild and you'd need to be adventurous. And then they looked at me and they said, so actually it, it may be okay. So I've asked them to ask the question and we'll see what comes back from Madagascar. And obviously the jungle and the animals there are all very unique. If you don't know, Madagascar is an island just off the east coast of Africa. Um, the Daintree Rainforest in Australia is another option. That's the oldest 
rainforest in the world, 130 million years old. Um, so that's a, a, an option I'd, I'd love to do one day. The Polynesian islands, um, again, it would be amazing to go to one of those and either circumnavigate it or cross it top to bottom, left to right. Um, but again, cost is a bit of a prohibitive factor. The Amazon is quite high on the potential list. And the idea there would be to can native canoe in for a day, either at the Amazon or at one of the tributaries, depending on how far in we went. Um, then park the canoes, stay on the, the, the riverbank that night, and then move for about three or four days, and then come back to the river, and then have a, another day canoe out. Um, but, you know, this will be coming up the fourth one we've done, and, um, you know, quite a few people have, you know, at least 50%, if not more, have done um, all three. And, um, you know, we're, we're looking this time to do something a bit more than jungle walking. It's amazing. But, you know, I want to try and build in either some of the skills of the, the canoeing or maybe even um, having a you know, building with the locals at like a, a more permanent base camp, you know, just out of the jungle. You know, so, so they'll teach us the techniques of how to make rope and, and how to build a structure that's waterproof and then do smaller patrols from there, um, small groups and, and lighter order. So, you know, with a sort of um, a tentative job that someone's got to do, they've got to go out and find something or, or recce something and then come back. So, so they're all options I'm thinking about at the moment. Um, and another one, a bit of a wild card is Cambodia. Um, it's been in the news recently. They found another lost city from the Khmer Empire. And Cam if you think um, the, the Lara Croft jungles where she's kind of climbing through the ruins, that's the jungles of Cambodia. So it's those kind of uh, ruins that are still um, all over the jungle in there. Okay, so um, I'll stop the share there. Could someone get the lights, please? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Just on the top switch is this. Great. All right, guys. Um, Wow, we still got almost the same as we started with, so it can't have been too boring. Thanks for sticking with it. Um, so, any um, any questions for anyone um, on screen or in here? Uh, yes. Any animals on only six days? Six days on the time in the jungle? Not really. Um, on the in Borneo, we saw orangutans, um, and in Guatemala, we saw um, howler monkeys, what fur dance saw howler monkeys, and in Borneo, we saw monkeys as well. And there weren't so many monkeys, monkeys really are the ones that you see a lot because they, they know when they're high enough up not to be in danger if they get too close to you. So, um, and we, you know, we saw footprints uh, of animals. So in Guatemala, we saw leopards, or jaguars footprints, and tapir footprints. Um, and we saw some big animal footprints in um, in India too, and we heard a tiger at night, which was surprisingly unscary because you could tell it was a long way away. But yeah, I heard the call. How could you tell it was a long way? I could, I, just you could hear it, like, kind of it, it echoed up through the valley, it kind of echoed up through the valley. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, but like I said, you know, if, if you you know you're in a wild place because you won't see many animals. If you see animals, you know they're used to human beings and they're comfortable enough to, to be seen and come close. So, yeah. Um, so you didn't see any snakes? No. Not this time. In Guatemala we did. Um, we saw snakes in Guatemala, um, but yeah, not this time. Because again, Two reasons you won't see them really. One is that, that you know that's how you know the area is wild, and two, we were such a big group that no matter how sad that you think you are, you know the, the smell that you give off and the, the, the tread and, and just the sort of vibration, kind of you know that those animals would sense a mile away, so they just scoop themselves away. Yeah. What did you eat in the jungle? How did you manage the food situation? Each other. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
uh, rashed it so it carried oil and food. So that's the, the heaviest part of the kit you carry is your food, really, food and water. So you need to carry at least four litres of water because you think there'd be water everywhere in the jungle, um, but there's times when there's not, you know. Uh, people get quite creative actually. There was so much rain coming that, you know, it runs down and drips up in a new and people were putting their water bottles there. Because um, you can purely tap it, you know, rainwater is about as pure as you get. So. Um, uh, but then food wise, mainly ration packs or, you know, people made some substitutions and things. Yeah, but yeah. Have enough for six days, so it's getting on for five, six kilos. Six days of food today. We did a similar thing when we did a job at Rose of Amza, which took three and a half days. Yeah. We took all the food with us and water with us, but it was for a much shorter period of time. Yeah. Six days. Yeah, it's a, it's a heavy lot to carry actually, yeah. six days, yeah. Mm -hmm. I say, it didn't, it didn't look like, um, I, I think the previous trip you said, you know, you, you sort of step off the trail and you can get lost straight away. This yeah. one didn't quite seem like there was as much um, yeah. growth. It, um, maybe it's just the pictures, you know, the, mm -hmm. but the, for this one, it was mainly, and maybe you can see from the, the pictures, the ridge line, so you've got the mountain coming down on the side, and then the ridge line is the easiest path. So as soon as you come off that, it gets really difficult and dangerous going. So, like along the ridge line, all the animals walk down it. If you think of how many animals are in the jungle, then they kind of leave a trail or leave a path. Um, but even the army, most of the time, walks on animal trails. Um, although they're the most easy to ambush, you know, they, they, it, the going is so hard if you're not on them. Have you got your knife around? No, I didn't bring it down. Yeah. Thing. Oh, so you were all able to bring those back? So, yeah, we, the question then, guys, was have you got the knife? And um, yeah, so each of the treks, we've been able to bring the knife back. Crazy. People got picked up for bringing a lighter back in their luggage, but you could bring a knife that's about three foot long um, in your rucksack. So, uh, so yeah, we. For those that have done all three, we're building up quite a collection of the knives of the world now. So we've got, you know, Borneo, Indonesia, Central America, and India. So we'll see which one we get next. Any any other questions at home on, on Zoom? Yeah, no. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, Stephanie? Well, I, I also put it in the chat. I was just wondering, when will you decide what the destination will be? Um, I, I've, I've set myself a target of knowing before Christmas so that I can, you know, give people a, over a year to, to decide, plan. There's usually about 18 months to two years between them, but I'll, I'll try. And, once I hone in on the place, it's, I, I know it's pretty straightforward then. I've just got to nail down. Um, you know, activities and costs, but yeah, that, that I, I aim to do it before Christmas. Okay, before Christmas. Yeah. Cool. You heard it here, so I'm under pressure now, but yeah, that's that's my aim to know. Yeah, that's nice. um, Being recorded. <laughs> cool. Uh, Rob, did you have a question? What was the, um, hello, Matt, really, really enjoyed the presentation, by the way. Thank you. What was uh, what was your emotions on the last night in the jungle? Uh, relief, <laughs> kind of, uh, relief for me that um, yeah. that it's gone okay, you know. But yeah. So as I, as I kind of mentioned, you know, it, just the same way as they say most car accidents happen within ten minutes of home. You know, the most dangerous time is when you relax and yeah. think we're nearly there, and that finish line fever. Uh, feeling so, um, yeah, kind of relief that that because this one there were times when I was wondering, um, am I going to have to find a way to get a couple of people back? Um, if I go back that way that we've just come up, are we going to lose anyone? It was probably the jungle trip where I've been most concerned about bringing everyone back safe, wow. um, and so yeah. You know, testing for everyone, but testing for me too, for sure. On the um, the, the kind of 
yeah, the responsibility side of it. So well, it's good to see you all back safe. Really last night. Sorry? Good to see you all back safe. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Uh, all right, guys. Well, um, thanks very much for joining. I'll, um, I'll, I'll uh, clip it as a recording, so I'll send it out as a recording as well. Um, great to see you all. Uh, great to see those that, um, that, that came and good to see your faces again. And um, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Matt. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Matt. That was great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> cool. See you guys. Good to see you again. Cheers. And you, Simon. Take care. See you, Maria. Yeah, nice to see you, everybody. Yeah. Good to see you, Leighton.